today's show, we have a return guest, my friend Amar. What's going on, brother? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for, for having me back. I'm excited to be back in the, the Decred booth, talk about money, economics, crypto, and decentralized credits. Of course. Well, let's, you know, stare at the elephant in the room now. Uh, what are your thoughts on current events and what does everything that's going on mean to you? We're certainly living in an interesting time. Uh, the stock market is at an all-time high, uh, yet unemployment is also nearing all-time highs or certainly in, in, in the highest in several decades. So it doesn't compute, right, when you first look at it. And uh, uh, I, I think back in Feb or March of this year, if we were to have asked ourselves, like, what does the macro outlook look like? And I think the answer at the time was was unclear. But as events have unfolded over the last several months, we can now see the response for all of our governments and our central banks. And it's starting to look a lot like, you know, this is a rerun of the 2008 playbook, but just on a much bigger scale. So essentially, it's uh, a lot more monetary expansion and QE. And, and when you really start to put a historical uh, analogy to this, it starts to look a little bit like uh, Japan in the late 1980s, where the, uh, Jap- there was a Japanese asset bubble. And uh, in order to sustain the economy, the government, in, in fact, started subsidizing and bailing out corporate companies. And what we're starting to see now is, you know, there's a direct correlation between the amount of fiscal stimulus uh, that the government is actually putting in and the sort of the performance of the, the stock market. So what, what history showed us in, in Japan was they, uh, the, the, the corporate sector is essentially, in, in some ways, became reliant uh, on the government bailouts, and the government ended up actually nationalizing a large portion of the economy. So you're actually starting to see how, uh, certainly in the U.S., the central bank is, is is buying corporate bonds, which is essentially a form of lending, uh, a form of a bailout, which won't necessarily always have to be paid back uh, to uh, to the government. And and you start to really look at it in historical terms, and what we see is really a risk of inflation. And I think potentially depending on which country you're in, even hyperinflation. So l- let me unpack that a bit more. Um, you know, since 2008, we've been in a, a sort of an era of, of monetary expansion. And people often ask, you know, how come we haven't seen um, in- inflation arrive yet? So the IMF said, you know, inflation was the dog that didn't bark after the 2008 recession, right? So, so really the way to unpack this is monetary inflation arrives before there is price inflation. So with the supply of money, it goes up first. And if only after that, there are successively you know, areas where price starts to rise. So if, from a traditional economic perspective, you know, when the supply of money uh, rises faster than the growth of the economy, you're going to experience inflation. And what we're seeing is uh, certainly the supply of money uh, has continued to increase at, at an all-time high. From a historical perspective, the reason I said that there is risks of potentially even hyperinflation in in in, in certain countries is is that we're we're starting to meet the conditions of uh, hyperinflation that we've seen before in history, and those conditions are as following: the first one is obviously an expansion of of, of money supply. I think we clearly see, you know, the expansion of money supply and actually the expansion of money supply uh, at a faster rate than the growth of, of the overall economy and the GDP. A second factor that happens uh, in periods leading up to hyperinflation is that usually there are periods of unsustainable debt. And specifically, it's the end of the long term debt cycle uh, where it becomes unmanageable to pay back all the all the old debt and and the best way uh, to squeeze out and to, to pay back the old debt is actually to print more money. So essentially, it's kind of like you know you, you take out a new loan to pay back the old loan. And the way that uh, historically governments and central banks have have responded to it is essentially they they inflate away the old debt. So you have the ability if the debt is denominated in your own currency to actually print more of the currency and actually devalue it thereby devaluing the old debt but that currency devaluation actually starts to have consequences specifically when it meets the third condition which is when the trust in central banking institutions starts to fall and we're starting to see more and more of that too over the last decade and a half since 2008 so the three conditions of you know increased money supply the end of a long-term 
unsustainable debt cycle and falling trust in central banking institutions. Whenever that's happened in history, that has led to periods of inflation and and many times hyperinflation. And I'll give you um, real life examples uh, of of where this happened. In China, which was the first um, user of, of, of fiat currency, uh, back in the, in the Tang Dynasty, when China became the first sort of country to issue their own fiat currency, which was no longer backed by any uh, in any sort of good such as gold or, or silver or any other metal, that continued for 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 several generations, several decades, until the 1300s, where it became unmanageable, and they realized that their their money supply had fast grown uh, over over the last several generations, and and it became vivid that you know the, the trust in their central banking institutions at the time their banking institutions actually started to go down they also reached a similar unsustainable debt cycle and what happened in china at the time in the 1300s is they actually switched over to to a new kind of currency so so that actually is is quite interesting because that pattern of you know uh, uh you know money supply unsustainable debt and falling trust in governments tends to lead often to hyperinflation which tends to often lead to switching over to a new currency a sounder money generally this also happened in germany and a recent example would be post world war 1 where you know we we've many of us have studied and seen the images in in germany where you know after the world war 1 the debts became so unmanageable that uh, the german government just kept 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 printing more money and and you know the value of the paper uh, was was so little that people would actually burn the paper to heat themselves and keep themselves warm. Warm. I think many of us have studied this in, in you know in high school history, for example. And what Germany ended up doing was they switched over to a new mark, a new currency uh, at the time. And I think finally, it, it actually even happened in 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 Yugoslavia in the 1990s, where the government had inflated away and created so much money and actually there was so much debt that there was literally no way to pay back the 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 debt and they ended up having to inflate away the debt and and ironically what 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 Yugoslavia did in the 1990s was they switched over when they switched over their currency they actually switched over to the German currency the mark so so these periods of uh, hyperinflation periods of, of money supply uh, these are patterns that have repeated in history before, and we're living in such an interesting time where once you see it through the prism of what has happened before, it starts to become clear how the current macro forces, even though in the short term, there's a lot of noise. And if, if you view this through a prism of history, it starts to become clear that there are real risks of inflation, potentially even hyperinflation, and potentially will lead to a new currency rising. And that becomes very clear and and historically speaking that has always resulted in a flight towards a sounder money well that leads into my next question um amar how would you define sound money for those that don't know what that is sound money is money that is not prone to changes in money supply it's 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 not money that can be easily tampered with it's usually money that has some economic soundness so hence the term sound money uh, it's money that usually protects against inflation. To historians and to economists, uh, sound money usually represents gold, historically speaking. Primarily because gold is not an asset that you can create out of thin air. Gold is uh, an asset that has an intrinsic value determined by the free market. And uh, you know, when you think of gold, uh, there's 190,000 tons of gold that have been mined above earth and that is sort of the the stock of of, of gold um, and it's it's very difficult to actually uh, change that stock in a material way so on, a, on an annual basis whenever new gold gets mined the overall supply of, of gold on on earth the 190,000 tons figure that figure uh, doesn't change by much so that's why people when they think of you know stock to flow ratio in precious metals or in cryptocurrencies that's what it speaks to is that you know the overall stock uh, is 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 at a point where it, it it not it cannot be easily changed and i think when you think of of, of bitcoin when you think of of, of decred their scarcity 21 million. I think that is sort of the fundamental principle that belies them as as candidates for a future uh, potential of, of, of economically sound, decentralized digital money.
think that's what gets people really most interested. So outside of the natural properties that make gold attractive, would you say scarcity is what makes it the most attractive? I think that's definitely got to be right up there because historically speaking, when you look of you look at things like copper, you think, look at things like silver, um, anything that is a collectible, anything that is abundant uh, in, in history generally tends to, to to not be a good store of value. So I think certainly scarcity is right up there. I think there's other uh, characteristics of gold as well, particularly its durability as an atomic metal that lends itself really well. To, to being a candidate for, for, for sound money. So I think this is partially why I think I'm so interested in Decred in particular is because of its ability to, to be a durable digital sound money. So when people think of, 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 of money, it can't just be money that has to be around for you know, the next five, 10 years. When we think of, of a new digital money, a new digital money that has to be economically sound and also has to be you know, durable for the foreseeable future, we have to expand our horizon to you know, several decades, several generations down. You know, we need to think of you know, literally a hundred year plus horizon if you want to make sure that you're building a, a true, new, better uh, form of, of, of money. And it's, it's not an easy process. It's not one that people will create and, and trust over time. I think this is why the Lindy effect matters as well. You asked about, you know, why, uh, uh, you know, people put faith in gold. I think partially it's because it's, you know, it's, it's been something that has had faith, uh, of, of people for, for thousands of years. So I think, you know, the scarcity, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a, it's it's a stronger story, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that that Lindy effect. This is why time and trust are so correlated and interrelated, right? There, you you cannot say you know overnight that the world will move to something like a fully digital distributed currency. Um, it, it, this process will take uh, decades and potentially even generations. So we're past the first decade. So I'd say you know, we're past the first innings. So I think it's sort of like you know when the internet first started. Uh, Nobody wanted to put their credit card on the internet, right? You remember that? Our parents were like, no, don't, don't ever buy anything on the internet. It's not safe. But over time, uh, you know, their trust gets natively built up in, in, into things. So in fact, it's, uh, uh, it, it's not going to be our, our kind of like our, our boomer parents. You can actually understand why they would not want to have faith in, in like a digital uh, currency like a Bitcoin or, or Decred. Uh, it, it's going to be the future generations like millennials, Gen Z, and others who are actually born into a world that is digitally native and, and people that can actually see the value for a form of an internet money that retains its value. Understood. Uh, why do you think the concept of sound money is foreign to most people? Well, primarily because it's not taught in, uh, in, in economic schools and you know, in our schools. Um, and I wish it, it were, uh, just as an economic concept. I think monetary economics, period. I think uh, I, I wish uh, we, we learned it a lot more. You know, when we look at our history books, whenever we learned it in school, they were primarily focused on stories of war, right? You think of, you know, the last, you know, whichever periods are, are discussed, people, you know, say World War Two, World, World War One before that, you know, a depression before that. So we, we kind of focus a little bit more on periods of, of war, um, you know, and, and conquests, um, intercultural uh, conflicts, but we don't learn as much about concepts of, of you know, principles of, of money. And I, I, and I wish our, 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 our curriculum actually covered concepts of finance, you know, teaching people about, you know, we have concepts of, you know, ec- economic incentives, concepts of uh, consumer behavior, monetary economics. These are, you know, e- even basic principles like saving. I wish our schools did a better job of that. What we've actually seen over the last you know, several decades is most economic classes have narrowed down their teachings to down to like a couple of numbers, right? Like GDP, you learn, you know, an input and an output figure. It's almost like a mathematical equation. And then everybody tries to optimize for an ideal number of, of, of GDP or GDP to debt ratio or, or a certain number of inflation, as opposed to thinking about sort of this from a human incentive element, right? Um, the greatest economists in, in history, you know, you go back to economists like, you know, Adam Smith, people like Milton Friedman, Frederick Hayek, uh, they all understood that the economy is more than a single number. The economy is about human cooperation, human economic coordination, and it's about incentives. 
and 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 I wish studying that concept uh, would actually uh, be more prevalent because understanding that money needs to hold on to its value, um, I, I think that's a fairly primitive concept that I think instinctively we all understood, but I think the term sound money may not be something that people understand. And, you know, the term, you know, Austrian um, economics is something that people may not understand. You know, there's different schools of, of competing theories of money, right? So traditionally, since the last uh, uh, sort of World War II, uh, we've we've subscribed to, or World War One, we've subscribed to the Keynesian school of economics, right? So, uh, but, but it's not the only school of economics. There's a monetarist school. There is sort of a, an Austrian school of economics. In particular, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Decred, they subscribe to more of the sort of the Austrian school of, of economics. Uh, uh, the Austrian economic school is also not one that is uh, taught widely in our school, uh, in our school systems. In, in fact, all the way back to when uh, Austrian economics was first created, um, people uh, in, in Germany at the time, um, car, they, they derided the, the concept of, of, of uh, Austrian economics because it didn't have as many numbers at the time to support it. Uh, in fact, even the term Austrian economics was meant as an insult. So Karl Menger when he was sort of the founder of, of Austrian economics in the late uh, 1800s and in the 1870s, uh, when he was a proponent of this, the Germans at the time actually called it Austrian economics because it wasn't proper Germany, right? It was like the other, it was like the alternate, it was the alt school of, of economics at the time. Uh, but, but more and more, you know, the, the principles of, of, of all of these economic schools uh, are, are are, are so valuable. You know, I, I don't personally subscribe to a single school of economics. I, I think we can learn from, you know, all different economics and, and we can learn different things. You know, after the Great Depression, uh, Keynesian economics actually helped us get out of that depression, actually, you know, through expansionary policies at the time. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, we're seeing at the end of like, you know, an 80 year, 70 year long term debt cycle. And what takes us forward may not be. Uh, what made us successful in the past. So I think we're actually going to see a lot more interest in concepts like what is money? Why does money uh, hold on to its value? If money starts to lose its value, uh, you know, are there alternate currencies? You know, we're actually going to see money as a product debated a lot more in the next decade. And I think, you know, concepts like sound money, concepts like monetary sovereignty are going to be one of the di biggest dynamics that plays out over the next decade. I'll give you kind of a, a, a quick example um, of, of, of why um, inflation will be kind of a big story of, as part of economics in the last, uh, in, in the next kind of decade. Um, over the last century, the US dollar, which is the strongest national currency in the world, is, it's actually lost more than 95% of its value due to inflation, right? So people People don't necessarily think of, of inflation being harmful in kind of real terms, uh, in sort of in in the moment. But I think as you start to put it in historical perspectives, even the strongest cur fiat currencies, uh, the U.S. dollar recently, uh, in in particular over the last century, it's lost ninety five percent of its value over the last century due to inflation, uh, and. This leads to a culture of more of you know consumption. So this is why you would see people you know are incentivized to consume more, and even our economic measures of of progress are actually measured around you know how do we measure uh, progress and wealth and prosperity? We measure it currently using measures like GDP, and GDP is in many ways just a measure of, of spending, right? It's a measure of consumer spending, business spending, and and you know that's culture of spending and credit, you know, it leads over the long period at the end of a long-term debt cycle to have uh, uh, interesting consequences. And I think we're coming to that point where concepts uh, like, you know, what is money? What is monetary sovereignty? You know, why do uh, currencies have to, uh, countries have to denominate their reserves in, in US dollar or the euro or gold will be something that will be really interesting. And I think I'm, I think the concept of monetary sovereignty is something that will be really interesting over the next decade in particular. Omar, how do you see inflation playing out with so much global debt dominated in the US dollar? And, you know, inflation is kind of like cigarettes. It's a slow killer. It's something people really don't feel. What are your thoughts moving forward? <laughs> I think that's an interesting analogy, like cigarettes, for sure. I think I, I could see why you say that. Um, so, 
so inflation, um, it, it comes in two forms, right? First, you see uh, monetary inflation, and then eventually that leads to price inflation. So when you see monetary inflation, i.e., you know, this first you you see it beginning with an economic uh, an, an expansion of the monetary supply. Uh, what that ends up doing is that first inflation doesn't arrive uh, equally to everywhere. Uh, one of the first signs uh, of the periods leading up to inflation is that uh, asset prices actually start to rise. So you actually will see irrationally, you know, things like uh, real estate, things like you know, stocks, assets, financial assets start to rise, and, uh, and that's actually a sign not that uh, the market is doing well. It's that in terms of real value, the currency is depreciating against. A measure of true assets. So we talked about gold being sort of like a traditional sound money. You go back to the 60s and and 70s until now, and you you kind of put gold uh, for for the price of gold until then and until now, and you'll actually see is even though uh, the uh, even though our incomes have gone up, uh, if you compare median income in terms of gold to now and kind of six decades ago. Income is actually median income is actually lower now in terms of purchasing power than it was, you know, several decades ago. And what that leads to is, you know, it feels like you're earning more, but you you try to earn more, but your money just doesn't go as far, right? So you end up having to have, you know, multiple income sources in families trying to actually earn money that leads to a, that is required to sustain a, a similar or, or same quality of life and this has profound social impact so we talked about uh, you know if, if your savings are are, are are kind of being debased you're in, in you're incentivized to move out of uh, cash holdings and into kind of more assets that will end up actually inflating the price of those assets and the people um who live on cash, the people that are the poorest in, in terms of society are actually the ones that actually get harmed the most because they're the ones that are actually not able to buy assets. They're not able to buy stocks. They're not able to buy a real estate. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in terms of their earning power, it gets diminished fast. And inflation doesn't arrive everywhere equally. It tends to start uh, by starting from a sort of a financial bubble and slowly trickle its way out. One of the interesting factors currently is you know, we're also experiencing technological innovation at a rapid pace, right? So, and technology is a deflationary factor. So, technology makes it cheaper to you know get more for your dollar. So, even though in, there are inflationary forces at play, there are def- technological deflationary forces at play as well. So, you can buy you know your, your phone now the, that you can buy um, you know for you know. 500, 800 bucks, uh, you know, it buys a lot more computing power from a technology perspective than it did, you know, a decade, two decades ago. So I think this, this is an example of technology. So I think we're actually seeing kind of uh, competing forces at play. It's, it's not like a single formula, even though uh, from an economic perspective, purely from a monetary perspective, uh, our currencies are on an inflationary path. There are deflationary forces uh, that are along the way. So Things like COVID, for example, uh, which is a, a, a deflationary force because, you know, as, as we're all cooped up in our homes doing social distancing, uh, we're not going out. We're not buying enough things. Uh, you know, we're, uh, consumer spending has actually gone down. Uh, so that's actually a deflationary force, right? So people, uh, if pe- people are not buying enough things, businesses are going to have to reduce the prices of their goods. They'll have to give us more incentives. Uh, to, to actually try to consume that. So that's a deflationary force. Technology is a deflationary force. So, Which also puts a halt to inflation. Uh, you need velocity in order to have inflation. Uh, even if the Fed's balance sheet is printing off, if, if people are not spending, inflation won't come. For sure, for sure. So these these are kind of, you need velocity either way. So I think and that's why my personal thesis is, you know, we're actually going to see deflation in the short term. And it's it's not until the second half of this decade where inflation, uh, and you'll start to see it, and you'll start to actually feel the inflation on, 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 a, on, a, on a day-to-day basis. So there's other factors like social political factors here as well. Things like, you know, when we think of tariffs, for example, uh, things of... Uh, 
the repatriation of supply chains. You know, as you, as you, you start to you know buy local, produce more in like you know developed countries, the cost of manufacturing is actually going to go higher, uh, and that will actually mean that the businesses will actually, if, if they have to pay more, they'll actually charge their customers more. They'll pass on those costs to their consumers. That's actually an inflationary force. Tariffs. Uh, you know, uh, you know, if if you uh, import something from overseas, uh, businesses have to pay a tax on on that good or, or or product. Then they'll pass on that price over eventually into the over to consumers as well. That's an inflationary force as well. So it's it's deflation in the short term. But I think to, to your point about velocity, uh, I think the 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 macro forces uh, of, of inflation will gain more velocity as we get into the second half of this decade, and that's when that's when we'll see you know money as a store of value it'll start to get questioned so so money from an economic perspective it's got two two main purposes right it has to be a store of value and it has to be a medium of exchange so you know your your dollar or you know whichever currency you you store in your bank account uh, you know it a it's a kind of it it acts as kind of a, a, a a vehicle to store and retain your wealth and B, you can actually utilize your currency to actually transact on a day-to-day basis. So that's the medium of exchange function. When inflation hits, it's going to erode the store of value thesis from currencies and there will be a need for alternative stores of value. And I think an alternative store of value is one where the concept of, you know, a, a digital store of value will be really interesting because up until now we've We've had basically physical stores of value, right? So we've had, you know, you can think of, you know, stocks, golds, um, you know, different commodities, arts, collectibles. These are all physical stores of value, right? Because uh, even stock ownership is generally like ownership on a physical kind of a, kind of a business. Um, but as we go into a digital native world, there will be digital stores of value. And if we can all agree upon the fact that, you know, when we are flying around in our in our flying cars, you know, several decades from now, we're not going to be carrying bars of gold around as stores of value. There will be digital stores of value. If that is going to be the case, then we, when you work back, you, you say, you know, digital stores of value today, they're extremely underpriced. And I think that asymmetrical upside is 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 what's really interesting. And not everybody will see it. Uh, you know, certainly if, if your time horizon is... Uh, you know, in a in a shorter time, it's it's not necessarily easier to see it. But you know, when you when you look at where we are in this century, we're 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 you know we're, we're 2020, 2020 is you know mostly over now. We can say that. So in, in fact, we're in in some ways you know when we get to twenty twenty one, we'll be closer to twenty fifty than we are to nineteen ninety. It that that's such a weird thing to realize that that, that I saw. Like we're closer to twenty fifty than we are to nineteen ninety. And, and I think, you know, the people whose time horizon kind of is closer to the 1990 horizon will will, will not necessarily see the value of, of, of a digital store of value. It's only people who see and are born into a digital native world that will understand the need for a digital store of value. And, and you know, concepts like uh, uh, economic uh, a monetary economics in, in terms of, you know, when, if, if their own local currency does not. Uh, retain um, uh, good value as a store value, then they're going to look for alternatives, and they're going to th- have to rethink about concepts like you know monetary economics, concepts like you know which currency, if it's not their local currency that provides them monetary sovereignty, which currency provides them monetary sovereignty. So I think you know not only a store of value but also monetary sovereignty. G- getting a sort of a voice is something that's going to be quite important. Well, let's get into that, Omar. What is monetary sovereignty, and why is it important? Monetary sovereignty is the right of a country to issue its own currency, the right to have a voice over its own money. So, for example, if your country issues its own money, it's because you want um, your, your country wants monetary sovereignty. I'm here in Canada where 90% of our population lives within 100 miles of the United States. But we issue our own money, the Canadian dollar, because we don't want to be reliant on the United States um, as, as a separate country. So this concept of monetary sovereignty is actually um, a contrast to the concept of a monetary union, which is where multiple countries actually share a common currency rather than issuing uh, their own individual currencies because there's a lot of benefits to having a shared currency. There's less transaction costs, there's less foreign exchange fees, there's less trade barriers that have been proven. Uh, 
And so the most fam famous example of a monetary union or a currency union is actually the euro, where 19 countries in Europe actually have a shared currency, the euro, uh, rather than having individual uh, country-based currencies. And, and from an economics perspective, this concept of a monetary sovereignty is actually quite relevant. And it was in the news quite a bit, specifically when Libra and Facebook came out and regulators had, had an aha moment where they realized all of a sudden that uh, their local monopolies over uh, money uh, from a currency perspective, their offline money, all of a sudden had an alternative, a digital alternative where people were no longer uh, tied to an offline currency. And and so this concept of monetary sovereignty is actually quite interesting. And, and there's a lot of central banks. If you go to their websites right now, if you go to the Bank of International Settlements website, if you go to the website of the IMF, they've all published some really, really cool papers about this. A second key reason why a concept of monetary sovereignty, uh, sovereignty is so relevant is because if we start to see hyperinflation, or if we start to see risks of currency failures, people will question which other currency to choose if their local currency is no longer a good store of value. So if you're like in Venezuela or Iran or some of the other countries, Libya, uh, all of a sudden, if your currency no longer, if your savings no longer retain its value, if you have your savings in your local currency, you're going to look for an alternative currency. And, and when you start to look at this, there's a couple of factors that become interesting that people look for when they can't use their own currency. Uh, the first factor is around, you know, they look for better stability of purchasing power. And the second is they tend to, over the longer term, look for having a voice, uh, a means of voice at the governance table. So, for, for example, you know, when, when countries in Europe... When they switched over to the euro, they only did so after establishing a means of governance where the individual countries in Europe that were participating under the auspices of the European Central Bank could have a means of voice at the governance table. So uh, the way the governance in, in the euro works is, is basically they have a tiered system where the countries that have the biggest economies in other words the largest skin in the game in the in the european union's success actually get the most voting power in the euro in the ecb similarly the concept of skin in the game uh, governance voting is also present at the imf the international monetary fund so not a lot of people know about this at first, but when you really read this up, the governance of the IMF is done on a quota basis where essentially the more quotas of special drawing rights, SDRs, it, it's essentially like a synthetic currency issued only for central banks by, by the IMF primarily. Um, it, it, the way it works is the more quotas you have of SDRs, the more governance rights you get, the more voting rights you get. So so in some ways, the IMF is already a functioning proof-of-stake governance system. So in, 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 in cryptocurrencies, we often talk about like a proof-of-stake, proof-of-work. Uh, proof-of-stake is ba basically like, you know, you, you allocate governance in this case uh, for the IMF. Uh, it, for, for people, whoever has uh, – more more skin in the game in, in, inside in terms of allocating governance to, towards the collective success of the IMF. So so bringing it back to the earlier question about uh, sound money, uh, so really there's there's two dimensions that people now look for that we've established when looking at a currency. One is economic soundness. They want money to retain uh, it, it, it's as a store of value. And they also want, people also want to have a voice uh, at the governance table. This is really interesting for Decred because for the first time, Decred is, is a sound money which also provides a voice. Gold doesn't do this. You know, gold, you, you own gold. You know, certainly you can hold on to your purchasing power, but gold doesn't allocate any voice. Bitcoin doesn't allocate any voice, but Decred does. That's quite interesting. It's actually the first time I've studied that I've ever come across this. And the first time I realized this, that was uh, kind of an aha moment for me. And, and it's, it's so new, this concept uh, with, with Decred, that I, I think it'll take people time to digest this. So sound money 
which also allocates voice, it's quite interesting. And and obviously, when you first start to talk to people about cryptocurrencies, we got to start with Bitcoin because Bitcoin obviously was the biggest improvement over traditional currencies um, in terms of the digitization of money. Uh, but then naturally, uh, I, I think when you go deep down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, inevitably, you're also going to uh, see the flaws of, of Bitcoin over the long term. And, and some of those flaws are going to be uh, addressed by, by Decred. Amar, how do you see cryptocurrencies, BTC, DCR, uh, innovating on traditional currencies? I believe that Bitcoin is the automation of the central banking function. It's hard to uh, describe immediately and understand the degree of innovation of Bitcoin uh, because Bitcoin is more than just a digital cash. Uh, right. So, so prior to 2008, there were other attempts at creating a digital cash, but you know they always required a central facilitator in order to coordinate that 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 money movement. Di- uh, Bitcoin was the first digital cash which did not require a central owner. It did not require a central facilitator. That's what made it so unique. Uh, so, so Bitcoin is essentially, in some ways, the unbundling of, of money and state. It's the digitization. It's the full digitization of money. It is the unbundling of money and state. Um, and, and Bitcoin, um, as a money, is is more than just a cash. Uh, Bitcoin is also a transaction settlement system on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain ledger. And Bitcoin the BTC, uh, the currency, actually has an automated monetary policy, uh, which will lead up to a total of 21 million max units. Uh, so, so that essentially in, in, in many ways is you know software eating away the world and software has now gone up all the way and essentially automated away uh, politics, away from monetary policy making. Uh, and, and, and so Bitcoin in particular uh, has eliminated or will eliminate over the long term, in my opinion, uh, many of the functions that central banks do in our economy today. Um, and, and I think uh, Decred actually enhances and expands beyond Bitcoin's design. It's, one way to think about this is that, you know, people talk about the rabbit hole. Uh, Bitcoin is a deep rabbit hole uh, and Decred is the same rabbit hole and it actually extends in additional dimensions. So if, if Bitcoin is like, you know, money and a transaction settlement uh, blockchain and the monetary policy uh, aut- automated with 21 million supply, uh, Decred has all of that. Plus, it also innovates in additional dimensions. So Decred has a built in mechanism for dispute resolution and by allocating voice uh, to, to people. Uh, to to say you know if if you need to come to an agreement you don't necessarily need to debate monetary policy making anymore um, you can automate that part away so we don't have to worry about inflation we don't have to worry about debasement but there's still humans need uh, an 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 sort of a, a means of of resolving uh, different viewpoints and and decred provides that so it essentially provides a structure of of governance without. Uh, creating an opportunity for you know political influencing in, into the money supply. That's actually a really really cool innovation that goes beyond Bitcoin, and that's something Bitcoin doesn't really have. Um, the other thing that that Decred innovates on and Bitcoin on is its self funding mechanism with uh, the ability for uh, you know some portion of mining rewards to be uh, going towards a shared treasury uh, that can actually help fund the ecosystem over the long long term uh, so that you know decred never has to rely on on, on local donors or or, or or investors who may have their own private interests that are separate from the interests at large for for the community at large that's two ways, and then the third way is is uh, the two differences on on uh, from between Decred and Bitcoin, and the third one is obviously the hybrid uh, proof of work plus proof of stake consensus mechanism, which may actually end up making Decred more secure over the longer term. So I think there's been some great research that's been done over here as well. So th- there's three additional dimensions that you can clearly see uh, that Decred uh, Decred innovates uh, upon Bitcoin. So, so the way I like to think about this is is that uh, you know most cryptocurrencies 
um, are actually just cheap imitations of Bitcoin. But Decred innovates in vectors that are going beyond the best properties of Bitcoin. Decred is actually extending the best parts of Bitcoin and then innovating in new ways that that. Bitcoin is actually not, not not competing in. It's additional vectors that are still left uncovered uh, or un, unaddressed by Bitcoin's design. And one of the biggest things that Decred does well is uh, Bitcoin. Uh, it, it makes a case for a commodity digital money that's apolitical, uh, kind of like a like a like a digital version of a gold, right? That that's kind of like the big thesis behind Bitcoin. Uh, but there's a big flaw in that thesis. In that, unlike physical gold, uh, which doesn't require any maintenance, and you know most of the gold that's been mined for the last hundreds of years is still around. Uh, you know, gold is quite durable; it doesn't rust easily. It's 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 got a great property of of you know staying alive over the long term without requiring any maintenance. Uh, Bitcoin is a software, and softwares do need engineering support. And it's okay to acknowledge that. It's okay to acknowledge uh, that there's a difference between economic soundness and technological malleability. Um, if if Bitcoin is a, like a, a new form of money, um, if eventually it it will need to upgrade, make upgrades in, in different areas, right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be today, but you know, you know, you can see down the line there's always software always needs to be updated. Uh, so you need to have some sort of mechanism of, of you know agreeing upon how to uh, make a potential update. Uh, you know, and who has voice in that sense? Uh, you know, if, if if nobody has explicit voice, then people uh, will will start to think of the well, You know, somebody's still coding, uh, somebody's still making a, ch- a change. You know, why don't I have that voice? So it's it's that's so, you know the concept of you know uh, sovereignty in some ways. The concept of voice is something that is not provided by Bitcoin, but it is provided by Decred. Uh, whereby you know, as a decred ticket holder, uh, you get allocated voice, um, in 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 a form of uh, you get you get a, a seat uh, at 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 the governance table for Bitcoin. You don't necessarily need to debate any of that monetary policy stuff, but as a software, uh, you know, and, and you know, as you as you can think of it over the coming decades, uh, that becomes more and more of an important vector. Finally, one of the key differences between Bitcoin and decred is is how they resolve uh, you know community differences so under the bitcoin system uh, the best way to say you know if 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 you can't uh, uh, come to an agreement upon something uh, is people tend to exit the system because you don't have a voice all right versus in in decred system uh, you know if if you and i have a disagreement uh, you know the, the way to resolve the 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 issues is actually, you know, the incentives are structured that, you know, both you and I are incentivized to buy more DCR so that either one of us will actually have a bigger voice at the decision making table. So the Bitcoin system, you can see in some ways, is 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 saying, you know, is it going to end up having forks and people exiting the network versus over the longer term, Decred will actually have uh people who are buying into the system because they want to have a bigger voice at the decision-making table. And that's a fundamental paradigm shift between the two um, cryptocurrencies I see over here that will play out really well in in Decred's favor over the long term. One final way to think about the differences between Bitcoin and Decred is that uh, Bitcoin is solving problems with fiat money that are not visible to the naked eye, but you can once you study monetary economics, once you study history, uh, these problems will become prevalent over time. Decred is addressing the design limitations of Bitcoin, which are not visible today. But as you broaden your horizon to a longer term, uh, these problems can can easily become bigger risks in in Bitcoin. So so Decred essentially has a longer investment thesis. Than, than Bitcoin, it has the same thesis as Bitcoin, except it's actually longer. Uh, that's a that's a key big difference between uh, and, and similarity and difference between Decred and Bitcoin. So, Omar, what are some of the weaknesses that you see within the Decred ecosystem that we can improve on? The way I think about weaknesses is kind of like in horizons, like there's a short term horizon, a medium term horizon, and a longer term horizon. Um, because these 
projects are still new um, and they're, they're going to go through different kind of risks and phases as they grow. Uh, so particularly for Decred, uh, in, in the short term, I think the, the biggest challenge or weakness is a lack of uh, brand name um, awareness and, and understanding uh, for, the, for the masses. So, so this has um, kind of various downstream uh, impacts as well, because, you know, if less people understand the asset, less people will uh, know about it, less people will talk about it, less people will trade it, less people will buy it, um, you know, and less people are kind of talking uh, and, and looking to buy it, you know, less exchanges uh, will list it. So I think this kind of has uh, this kind of brand awareness. Uh, it, it is kind of a key part of the, of the network network effect um, that, I, that I think we are looking to address. You know, it's, there's so many initiatives, though, at the same time as a mitigant to this that are being done by Decred uh, that actually directly speak to, you know, unpacking Decred, uh, you know, in, in, in various different ways, whether, you know, on-chain analysis, economic analysis, technical analysis, um, just community building events uh, that are being done in, in a more tasteful manner, uh, you know, across so many different continents um, that, that I think this is, a, this is a good way to kind of tackle. It's, it's a very natural grassroots way to bootstrap uh, a, a brand name recognition and a network effect that, that Decred is doing um, to, to address, uh, you know, education uh, about this particular area and education and awareness about how Decred is solving um, unique problems in a really unique way. Um, in the medium term, uh, probably the biggest challenge I'd say is is, is regulatory risk, uh, particularly uh, you know when you think of you know when you compare it to something like uh, Bitcoin or an Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum have already gotten uh, they've already passed uh, you know a bunch of tests that regulatory uh, bodies have placed on them. Uh, they've already had like congressional hearings. You know, already had different kind of SEC, different kind of people who have. Uh, looked at uh, at them and actually said, you know, they're not securities. You know, they're not going to be subject to certain laws. Uh, Decred, um, it, it's still so new. Um, it's it's not on the radar for for regulators yet. And I, and I think there will come a time when uh, regulators will scrutinize it a lot more closely, and there will potentially be some adversarial regulators as well. And so we have to think about, you know, th- there's probably some unknowns there around, you know, how how do they treat. Um, you know, so Decred, you know, it, it, it allocates kind of, it, it gives staking rewards. How does a regulator think about that? Um, um, I, I think those are still unknowns that will probably be addressed in the next decade or so. Um, on, on the flip side of that, you could also argue that, you know, local regulatory uh, bodies don't necessarily uh, impact Decred over the long term as much because, you know, offline laws in, in local jurisdictions don't necessarily apply to an online network like Decred. So, you know, you, if, you know, a small, you know, or, you know, whichever country tries to uh, pass a law to make it hard to access the Decred network, it still, you know, cannot um, shut down the Decred network. Uh, so in, in some ways, this anti-fragility and, and, and imperviousness to, to local uh, offline laws is, is, is actually a strength that, that will prevent and that will kind of be a defense for, for Decred, in my opinions, over, over the medium term. Uh, and I think finally, over the long term, um, I, I think probably governance, um, in governance at scale, is still such a new concept. Uh, so, so you know, the empowerment of people directly, I think that's so powerful, but it's also, you know, if you think of, you know, billions and billions of people, uh, each now having a voice with no central coordinator, that has uh, not necessarily been implemented at scale. Uh, so, so, I, so I think over the coming uh, decades, uh, there's going to be, uh, it, it's certainly going to be an, an interesting ride. Well, Lamar, I appreciate you taking out the time and coming on the show. Uh, do you have any final thoughts, uh, message to stakeholders, and just anything you want to communicate? In closing thoughts, um, I'd say that we are both um, lucky and unlucky to be where we are in terms of history today. Um, we're, we're potentially unlucky because of the fact that, you know, periods leading up to hyperinflation, there is generally a lot of social unrest um, and, and disagreement between people. There's polarization. Um, so, so those are periods of sometimes turmoil in, in history uh, before there's hyperinflation and before currencies tend to change. Um, at the same time, we're also lucky. We're lucky because uh, 
the arc of history bends towards progress and you know I, it each time you know if, if you recognize a pattern er, early um, you tend to get rewarded handsomely and you know in this particular case uh, I believe this will be the largest uh, wealth creation event uh, for for Millennials and particularly Gen Z who are coming into this world um, in in this is probably going to be the biggest wealth generation event of, of our lifetimes and maybe even, you know, the next generation's lifetimes. Um, so so if you're here right now, uh, you're here early. If you're here in, in Decred, um, you're, you're here basically in, in Bitcoin equivalent to 2013 in terms of money supply. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm just um, excited in, in some ways to be here. And um, I'm I'm hoping to do to do more my part of of uh, contributing towards uh, the community. Thanks.